Hey, hello! This is Professor Game, where we interview successful practitioners of games, gamification, and game thinking, who bring us the best of their experiences to get ideas, insights, and inspiration to help us in the process of getting students to learn what we teach. And I'm Rob Alvarez. I work at IE Business School Publishing, where we create interactive and engaging learning materials. Wow, and today we have Jeff Gomez. Jeff, are you prepared to engage? Indeed I am, from New York, New York. <laughs> Let's do this, Jeff. And Jeff that we have today, he is the CEO of Starlight Runner, and he's a leading expert in the fields of brand narrative, story world development, creative franchise design, and transmedia storytelling. He specializes in the expansion of entertainment properties, premium brands, and social political themes into the highly successful multi-platform communications and international campaigns. As a producer, he has been accredited by the Producers Guild of America, and he also develops stories in the worlds of films, TV shows, video games, toys, books, comics, apps, virtual reality projects, and theme park attractions. This deepens the engagement and accelerates the development of participative communities, resulting in mass audience approval, brand loyalty, and increased, of course, revenues. Jeff's pop culture work has impacted blockbuster properties like Disney's Pirate of the Caribbean, James R. Cameron's Avatar, Hasbro's Transformers, Sony Pictures' Spider-Man, oof, huge fi- uh, fan of Spider-Man, and Men in Black, uh, Microsoft Halo, Nickelodeon's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and, you know, many, many awesome stuff. He's, he's been developing transmedia campaigns and tra- uh, participative brand narratives for Coca-Cola, Pepperidge Farms, the Spartan Rains, Rage, uh, Race, huge fan as well. <laughs> other current <laughs> clients that are including Electronic Arts, Season Workshop, Disney Parks, Resorts, and World Vision Canada. His his methods have been also applied, and this is very interesting for, for us, uh, into the educational and geopolitical causes. And they have accelerated positive self-organized social movements and increasing resistance to crime, violence, and corruption. Through the application of the collective journey and transmedia population activation models, Jeff has helped optimize communications for large NGOs and addressed crisis in Mexico, Colombia, I'll be in Colombia in a few weeks, by the way, Australia and the Middle East and North Africa region. So, Jeff, this is a very amazing introduction, and I'm stoked to have you in (laughs) Professor Game. Is there anything you would like to, to, to tell us before we get started on the interview? Well, um, uh, that was a lot of stuff that you introduced. I, I'm not <laughs> used to hearing the whole thing uh, uh, read read off. So uh, feel free to talk to me about any aspect of, of the, the work. I think uh, in our conversation, people will start to understand that there are some fundamental tenets that my company applies that allows us to work in comic books and video games and movies, but also in uh, geopolitical uh, uh, crises and, and other types of uh, uh, marketing and advertising work. Fantastic. Thanks. Thanks for all of that. And of course, I did read the whole introduction because there were many points I didn't want to miss because they, they are very, very relevant, all of them, at least for me. And <laughs> as, as usual, you, you try to scratch your own itch when you have your own podcast. So. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> I can accuse myself of that. No problem. So, Jeff, the, the, the first thing that we would like to ask you and, and that we do this with all of our guests is to know what does a regular day with Jeff Gomez look like? Uh, wow. A regular day. There, uh, No two days are the same uh, here at Starlight <laughs> Runner Entertainment. But the pattern generally is that, uh, well, we need to um, uh, understand a, an enormous amount of information in order to do our work. Uh, we, because we work in entertainment, but also in um, uh, global politics um, and technology, um, I, I spend uh, the first hour or two early in the morning uh, just absorbing the news of the day and, um, and understanding uh, where, where uh, my company stands. Often uh, the, the companies we work with are in the news and learning the latest developments with them is also very important. Um, I then uh, uh, do correspondence. Um, mm-hmm. uh, uh, amazing uh, uh, things can come through uh, email at any given day. I can be contacted by a politician or a movie director or, or a film producer, a studio, um, uh, and, uh, and I'll do that. But also, uh, I, um, I try to devote at least a few minutes a day to students, um, uh, uh, people doing research for uh, college thesis, 
um, uh, someone, uh, a kid in high school who's interested in transmedia, things like that are important uh, to me to, uh, to stay in touch with, with uh, uh, you know, people who are, want to learn more about transmedia storytelling and collective journey uh, story model. Um, then I get to the meat of the day. Uh, what is the job I, I have at hand? Um, uh, because my job is to supervise everything that's going on at Starlight Runner, um, I will look at all of the uh, uh, material that has been sent to me by uh, my various producers or writers, um, and I will annotate them. Um, so one day it could be um, a, a treatise on the mythology of Spider-Man uh, in order to integrate the character uh, into the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And that's awesome. That's so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> As you already know, I'm a huge fan of, of Spider-Man. I inherited that from my father. I still have uh, his comic books. So. <laughs> he's uh, he's uh, such a fantastic character. And, and being able to, to play with him and uh, advise uh, Sony on, on the best use of Spider-Man and Spider-Man's universe, Venom and all those other characters, uh, was great fun. Um, uh, but at the same time, a, an hour or two later, um, uh, there's a client who will contact me and say, hey, you know, um, uh, Donald Trump just did this thing and we don't understand why he said it and why he's doing it. Can you please explain it to us? What is the narrative uh, 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 that is beneath um, the, the words, the, the the superficial story of whatever the president is doing today. And uh, we have to devote some time to, to studying, analyzing, and breaking that down for our client too. Um, and uh, it goes uh, back and forth all day, uh, a different uh, subject, sometimes wildly uh, uh, divergent. And of course, our clients are all over the world, so I'll take Skype uh, uh, calls um, at any given hour of the day. Uh, and uh, sometimes teaching classes in China or, or uh, Eastern Europe through Skype. It's uh, so much fun. And, uh, and then um, it, it doesn't really end at night. I, I go home and, and uh, check out the latest uh, shows and Netflix movies and things like that because I have to, I have to know so much in order <laughs> to be of value uh, to my clients. That sounds very, very exciting, Jeff. I have to say that. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> it's fun. Um, the, the next thing that we would like to know uh, is for you to tell us a story. And of course, this is the, probably your specialty, creating the narratives around around topics. And, and this time we would like to tell you to tell us a story of what you could call your favorite failure when creating a, a collective journey. Something that probably set you up for, for future success or for learning in, in the future. What would you say has been your, one, one of those times? Well, um, uh, let me start by very briefly explaining uh, collective journey storytelling because I can't tell you how I failed until I tell you how I <laughs> <laughs> that uh, makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, you know, um, uh, we all, everyone in the world, is familiar with the hero's journey. Um, it's a, a a model of storytelling described by Joseph Campbell. Um, that kind of exists in every TV show and movie we've ever uh, enjoyed, even uh, novels, comic books, uh, video games. Uh, the hero's journey is the story of the, the young man who um, uh, something traumatic happens to him and he needs to be trained by a mentor and go out into this kind of mysterious world to uh, do uh, battle with the forces of evil, uh, he gains allies and uh, the, earns the favor of the gods, uh, mm -hmm. eventually overcomes the, the bad guy, uh, takes the treasure and brings it home and gives it to his community. Um, you know, variations on that we've seen in everything from Star Wars to Harry Potter to uh, soap operas and <laughs> comedy shows. <laughs> Uh, you just see it all the time. Um, the the uh, the problem with the hero's journey is it, it has been commodified by Hollywood, and so um, you know, in more recent decades, 
the hero tends to be a white male. <laughs> um, the the journey uh, tends to be one uh, where uh, he is asserting kind of masculine traits to overcome his opponents. Uh, there is either a physical or psychological violence in resolving the, the problem. And the problem is resolved when the villain is defeated and the hero wins. Um, and, uh, and of course, the community is depending on the hero. So they, they uh, succeed because the, the hero succeeds. Um, that's, the, um, the, 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 that's problematic because... Um, we are decentralizing ourselves as uh, as a human race from the Hollywood notion. Um, uh, we are no longer tolerating being dictated to by a single kind of narrative entity um, that is uh, uh, dominated by a very specific uh, sense of what is right and what is wrong. Um, uh, the internet and social media has allowed us to uh, gain a voice um, uh, in, as individuals all around the world. Um, and that opens us up to a diversity of thinking. There are all kinds of different values, all kinds of different ethnicities, cultures, um, each of which want to see themselves in story. Um, and, of course, we are seeing the rise of, of women and uh, uh, the feminine uh, notion. In fact, the whole spectrum of gender um, that, that just is, is yearning to be represented in story. So um, uh, I am suggesting the collective journey as an evolution over the hero's journey. Um, uh, the collective journey takes all of these kinds of voices into account. Um, uh, we don't need to be uh, the classic uh, blonde-haired, blue-eyed male <laughs> hero uh, in order to um, uh, 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 conquer the, the bad guy. In fact, we don't have to polarize um, uh, the conflicts in our stories anymore. It doesn't have to be about good and evil. Um, it, it can be about a diversity of, of, uh, of senses of what, what should happen because the system that we exist in is flawed. And, um, and so these story worlds can represent systems in need of healing, in need of different ideas, diverse ideas combined to heal them. So we're starting to see the emergence of collective journey stories uh, on TV, uh, Game of Thrones, uh, Orange is the New Black, The Walking Dead. These are whole worlds with lots of different characters, not necessarily an individual male hero who's going to save the day, right? Um, and, um, and each of those worlds have systems that are flawed. In fact, they're so flawed, we might, um, the world could be destroyed. <laughs> um, if we don't fix that that flaw, and and these stories are huge epic stories about different uh, um, groups of people, kind of knocking heads, uh, sometimes killing each other in the process, but hopefully it, it, uh, working toward um, uh, uh, what is ultimately a common goal, uh, the healing of this uh, uh, broken or damaged uh, uh, system. Um, uh, we, um, uh, we first uh, uh, started examining uh, collective journey narratives when we're watching people self-organize around social media to create movements. The, the Arab Spring, Black Lives Matter, um, uh, really, really fascinating because these uh, uh, movements don't have leaders. They just are a bunch of people who said, you know what? Let's do something about this flawed system. Let's join forces spontaneously and and try and, and fix it. Um, yeah, that's fantastic, and, and and it's something that we've seen going all around. And and to be honest, when 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 I heard your 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 talk in gamification Europe, the first thing I thought is is what's more of a collective journey than the journey that students take through through the educational system. 
I mean, what could be more of a collective journey than that? And and there's many, many aspects that I, I think, and we'll probably get into this throughout the interview, but I, I thought it was fascinating and a fascinating approach, especially in, in, in my case, of course, I'm flawed towards <laughs> thinking in education and training and learning. Well, let's talk about let's talk about education, because that was one of the first real applications of collective journey storytelling that that we applied in the field. And um, and the results were really, really interesting. Um, uh, and, and, but also challenge. You, you said, oh, uh, can you talk about some failure? <laughs> uh, uh, there, there was a little failure uh, there, too. So, um, uh, you know, would you like to direct this to? Please, to, uh, let's, let's do it. Sounds uh, fantastic. That's great. Um, uh, we were approached by uh, a university in Australia about um, helping them uh, to retain students who were uh, indigenous or uh, were of low socioeconomic status or were uh, immigrants, uh, international students who were uh, coming to the college and um, uh, the university. And they, they were fairly quickly, they were failing. They were dropping out of um, uh, university. And um, uh, they had tried a number of um, uh, remedies uh, that uh, that did not work. Uh, in fact, they had many, many services designed to prevent students from uh, dropping out, but they were failing. And, uh, and, and because we have this kind of transmedia approach, um, uh, uh, the ability to kind of uh, generate uh, interest and fandom uh, amongst an audience, they thought, well, maybe there's some application uh, to to getting uh, students to stay interested and and stay loyal to the the university so that they can make it through. Um, so we went and uh, and explored this, and um, uh, what we uh, uh, started to learn uh, right away was that there was a disconnect between uh, the way that the university was communicating. And the way that these young people were receiving uh, language or, or, or understood the, the language of this huge bureaucracy, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, and, and they just they didn't get it, you know. Um, so so uh, how do you apply collective journey storytelling to get uh, students to understand what's what's going on? It wasn't easy. <laughs> um, the the uh, a lot of the students were uh, indigenous uh, Australians and um, and they ca came from rural communities that were highly didactic um, that where, where um, uh, there was a, a kind of simple cause and effect in in their lives, whereas uh, university can be oblique. They can assume that you know how to do research or how to um, uh, discipline yourself in order to to uh, get your work done. Um, they assume that you know how to navigate a complex bureaucracy or even physically navigate yourself around a, a campus. And uh, what we discovered was that this was none of that was the case <laughs> with the students. <laughs> Too many you know. assumptions. Right, right. So um, what is the assumption of an administration when they look at, at uh, college kids who cannot do any of these things? Well, the assumption is they're not worthy of being included in the college. They're, they're not smart enough. They're not uh, studied enough. They, they don't qualify for being here. So they get kicked out, <laughs> you know. And um, and really, the um, uh, the the problem that we saw was a problem of story, of of language, um, uh, the the fact that these young people, um, uh, you know, came from places where they had no no preparation for the kind of story they were being told by the university, um, and uh, and this created a stalemate. And, you know, it was difficult to get the university to change its story. 
um, because, you know, they're used to doing things a certain way. <laughs> of course. Um, that, that's what okay. bureaucracy is almost about, no? Yeah, yeah. Why should we change um, uh, in ways that will kind of coddle these students? These students need to change so that they, you know, are, are going to make it through this kind of bureaucracy because this is more like the real world. Um, and, uh, and we said, no, <laughs> it's not, it's not that much like the real world <laughs> because we don't understand your bureaucracy and we're, and we make video games. <laughs> um, so, um, and we're lying uh, outside in the real world as well. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it shouldn't be this complicated. Um, and and the language shouldn't doesn't necessarily have to be so harsh. Um, you know, the first uh, time you reach out to a student who is um, uh, not doing well in with their grades ought not to be a warning. <laughs> you know, if you don't get better, you're going to be kicked out of school. Um, um, that's... So, sorry to interrupt, but this reminds mm -hmm. me, there was, uh, I studied in Universidad Simón Bolívar in Venezuela, and there was like sure. an iconic sculpture uh, somewhere around the entrance. It was like, it looked like a, some, so, some sort of a mountain or a huge rock, mm. and you could see people climbing to the top of the rock. But if you looked at the details, you saw st like micro stories of interactions between people. There was a few people uh. who were helping each other out. But yes. there was a lot of people competing to each other to reach the uh -huh. top and, you know, achieve absolute excellence and, you know, being the best and this whole thing and the people on top kicking people down so that they <laughs> didn't reach them. So it, it was and it was like an icon of the university. And, and I enjoyed my, a lot of my time there. It's a, it's a fantastic university. But that yeah. that icon of the university just I couldn't understand how that could be something that they looked up to. It, it, it's interesting because what you're describing is exactly the the complexity, the conundrum that we were encountering, and and um, uh, it, it felt like we were failing um, because we we could not get these two groups um, uh, to communicate um, uh, in different ways to to each other without them feeling as if they were compromising themselves um, or, or somehow uh, compromising their integrity. Um, uh, and, and here's where a collective journey uh, really came into play. Um, at, at a certain point, we gathered um, uh, a number of the indigenous students, the, the, the cohort that we were trying to help um, and their leadership and, and said, look, no one's coming to save you. <laughs> Literally, there, there there is no hero um, uh, who will who will stand on top of the hill and lead you o over to to stay in in college and and get uh, uh, get a degree. No one. So guess what? Um, you're going to have to uh, help yourselves. Um, so um, uh, we we taught them. Um, that the very language, the, the very cultural mythology that they've lived with for thousands of years, which helped communities survive in, in the Australian desert, um, ought to be the same set of values um, that brought them together here on this giant, sprawling, uh, uh, ultra-modern campus um, uh, so that they can um, uh, help themselves navigate together and, um, and, and push themselves uh, uh, through the years and, and into graduation. So like your statue, <laughs> um, <laughs> th there, were, there were a few that were grabbing each other's hands and helping each other up. That's what we were uh, uh, teaching uh, to these young people. And, and um, uh, because there wasn't going to be a lot of cooperation on the part of the university, at least at first, um, what we did was um, uh, take a, a multi-platform, a transmedia approach by placing um, uh, uh, indigenous students um, in, um, in all the different media on campus so that they could have a voice 
um, the, the school newspaper, the radio station, podcasting, uh, social media, Facebook, uh, um, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat. Um, uh, we, we made sure that, um, that there were uh, uh, student cohort members manning each of those um, uh, platforms, giving each other voices. And then uh, we, uh, we taught them how to, to talk each other through the challenges that were on the campus and how to solve a lot of those challenges themselves. Um, it, it started to work almost immediately. Really, really um, uh, exciting to, to watch them uh, come to this realization that, that their community and not an individual hero uh, was going to, to save them. And, um, uh, and then to watch them come up with ways to effectively uh, create a translation uh, a tool <laughs> so that the bureaucracy goes in one side and clear English, <laughs> you know, clear <laughs> language comes out uh, the other. That, that's fantastic, uh, Jeff. That sounds like yeah. a very, very exciting, exciting moment to have lived. And and there, there's a few things I would like to take from your story. Sure. Um, the, the the first one certainly is the fact that there's there's many things that that are faced in in in, in your life and everybody's life and. Uh, there's different types of challenges depending on if you're minorities, majorities, whatever whatever your your life path is. But there, I, I think there's a trend that's starting, as 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 you were saying at the beginning, that's starting to pick up every time some more. And it's the fact that we have to stand up for ourselves, and that doesn't mean that you have to be the hero that stands up for everybody else. That means that you have to be part of of that solution, part of that that new way of doing things and that part of that and 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 that's something that we, we, we we've sp right. spoken about many times the, the the conundrum of facing education and and the many flaws that it has like like many systems i'm not only talking sure. about education but that's something that we have to face together and otherwise there's there's not going to be it's not going to be the president of or the secretary general of who's going to come down and put his hand and you know heal the all the problems that education has it's it's got to be us and and i i'd like to highlight that as a as a very very high point in in, in your story is there anything else that you would like to take away from from what you just uh, explained very well um, well, it's it's certainly um, uh, the the fact that um, that yes, you can give uh, effectively the solution to these uh, uh, to the to the cohort to in this case these these students, but you you can't uh, do it without creating very very simple products and services that um, uh, that can help to accelerate. Uh, their behavior. And this is where the kind of gamification uh, uh, steps in. Um, I'll give you a few examples of how we kind of gamified the collective journey of, of these students on this campus. Please. Um, our, our research indicated that um, uh, um, uh, indigenous Australians have a big problem with failure. Uh, they would just as soon go away Uh, than, than to stay there and face failure. And this is one of the reasons why uh, uh, so many uh, indigenous people leave college within the first year, leave university in the first year. Um, uh, we researched um, where uh, these young people were most comfortable talking about failure, which, which is really just to confess a problem. Uh, that, that they couldn't solve by themselves. Um, and uh, we, we learned that culturally, um, uh, indigenous Australians talk to each other in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's just a thing. In, in their families, you know, uh, uh, they, they might gather together uh, get, preparing for the day in the bathroom and, and kind of murmur their problems to each other. Mm, and, that's that's uh, very and, interesting. And receive uh, instruction um, from other family members. So we created a program called Bathroom Confessions <laughs> <laughs> on the campus 
where where we uh, uh, created uh, little uh, b- kind of ballot boxes in the bathrooms with uh, uh, pen and paper, and you could write down your problem and a way to contact you and put the paper in the in the box, um, uh, and uh, and others would would take the papers and uh, and read them and say, oh, I can help this person. Oh. Wow, and, <laughs> and it was it was a community solution as well. That sounds yes, amazing. Exactly, exactly. A lot of social interaction. So, um, uh, so little things like this um, uh, truly helped to um, uh, accelerate, and uh, you know, uh, it, it's surprising, it's delightful, it's um, it, it it made them uh, uh, feel desired, loved, um, and um, and supported. And it, it actually contributed to uh, a, a, a substantial retention. Uh, our understanding is 5% uh, higher retention from the first year of the program to the second, uh, a spike in 5, 5%, whereas in, elsewhere in Australia, it dropped by 2%. So that was a 7, 7% spread yeah. uh, in the first year. Um, a truly uh, uh, thrilling. Amazing. Um, Jeff, a uh, 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 quick learning that I got from that and, and something that it's very important that we, we talk about all the time and, and it's very, very important. It's, it's always stressed is the fact that you have to understand the people that you're creating something for. That's, that's fundamental. That user research, um, you can call it many ways in, in many different areas, but the important thing is that you get to know and understand how, how these people think as deeply as you can. And that's going to help you Whatever it is, the solution that you're creating, that whatever is the design you're creating, it's going to help you a lot because you're going to understand if that solution is good for them or if it might not be good for them. And of course, you're going to experiment as well and you're going to fail and you're going to learn new things and, and new ways to, to communicate with, with your audience. And Jeff? If, yeah, mm-hmm. I, I, if, I, if I, I can yeah. add to that, that sure. thought, because it's such a good thought that you, you're articulating. Um, uh, we try not to run purely on uh, data on numbers that are handed uh, to us. Uh, we appreciate uh, data and and uh, and know how to absorb that into our work. Um, but um, uh, what truly helped us and always helps us are what we call micro narratives, um, which is basically to actually speak actually to talking people. to people. <laughs> yes, and and giving them a, a few minutes to tell you their story. Um, you know, when you get uh, uh, dozens or hundreds of them, you start to see very, very powerful patterns uh, emerge that that are tremendously helpful. That's true. Um, so, Jeff, I would like to, to to make you another question, and and it's about precisely about the collective journey. And, and it's if you if we can, I know it's it's a very complex thing, but give us a few a few strokes. Of what you would say is is perhaps a process, a way you approach the collective journey when, you, when you're going to solve something using collective journey. Is there any approach that you use or any system, any process that you, that you have for that? Uh, uh, yes. Um, the, um, uh, uh, first of all, um, you know, we, we have to acknowledge that, um, uh, you know, that, that people's default mentality is, is hero's journey. <laughs> um, so we we have to make sure that um, that we understand the story that's that's being uh, uh, told, um, uh, the story that people understand in the first place. The the the, the same exact thing as as what we just talked about, um, uh, hearing people's stories, examining the, their cultures. Um, but but then um, there's a a kind of um, uh, engine that uh, that needs to be uh, constructed uh, in the um, in the collective journey that allows us to um, uh, uh, to start um, uh, figuring out how to um, uh, get people uh, to activate and get people to to truly um, uh, uh, you know start to realize what what can be uh, done so um, that, um, uh, that modality is, basically, uh, in, in short goes like this. Um, uh, the, the first thing we have to set up is a listening mechanism. 
right? What we call the architecture for dialogue so that we are hearing uh, what uh, the, 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 the target audience has to say about the subject at hand. And we can set up a, um, a, a way for those voices to continue to be integrated into the communication, right? Um, uh, communications fail, particularly in education, when the educator is speaking in a language that the, the student doesn't even understand, hmm. you know, um, uh, by listening to the, the audience and integrating the audience's voice, their concerns, um, uh, their language into what is being communicated, you have already uh, created a powerful bond. Um, the, the, uh, so, so that first step is authentic listening. The, the, the second step is to make sure that they can communicate um, uh, these, these tenets, these aspects of story to their friends uh, 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 so that they can uh, spread the word through social media, so that they can uh, reinforce uh, what's being uh, taught to them uh, with um, uh, their community. Um, and um, and uh, we call that superpositioning, the, the, the notion um, that you are able to um, uh, take the story and play with it and spread it is super, super important in, in collective journey storytelling. Um, the third step is social self-organization. Um, uh, what, what will it take to get people to um, act and behave in concert um, uh, so that their voices, when combined, can affect some kind of change um, uh, so that, that a whole uh, people could lift themselves um, uh, and improve their, their, their knowledge, their understanding, um, uh, do things like resist um, uh, extremism or, or push back at crime. Uh, we do this all over the world. So this social self-organization is something that, that we promote by uh, uh, creating products and services like the, the bathroom confessions, <laughs> <laughs> um, but on a kind of cosmic scale. Um, and then this, the fourth step is, is change making. By, by creating um, uh, a kind of ticking clock, by, by creating uh, incentives for, for people to take action. Um, so you have this, this big crowd of, of people who, um, who are, are told that if they just do something small, they can affect seismic change. That's possible now in the age of the Internet. And, um, Absolutely. Um, and, and so we promote that, and change can and does happen. So that's the, those are the four parts of the collective journey engine. Authentic listening, super positioning, that's uh, uh, social media communication, social self-organization, the creation of a movement, and change making, uh, taking action. That movement takes action and something actually happens uh, and changes, hopefully for the better. Fantastic. Th thanks for that. That process sounds amazing. And I'm, I'm sure there's many things that our, our teachers, professors or educators in general here can can implement from from that process. And now we're, we're going to move into into what we would, could call the rapid fire questions. Um, sure. Here, <laughs> we're going to, to be looking for, perhaps for tips, tools and tactics that we can implement in our in our daily teaching, in our d daily education, etc. So Jeff, the, the first thing, and, and this is this is not going to be exactly a tip, but we would like to know what's your favorite game. My favorite game? Oh my gosh! Um, <laughs> uh, since I was a child, I loved uh, fantasy and science fiction, especially um, worlds that are absolutely convincing that that uh, I can get lost in, um, and and um, uh, they need to feel real. So I've uh, I've loved the um, uh, the the latest um, Zelda uh, Breath of the Wild, Gosh, you know, because the Zelda things are, are just incredible. Uh, the world is so fully realized, and the characters are warm and interesting, and um, 
uh, I can accomplish uh, a lot of the uh, adventure without um, uh, killing too many things. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've really enjoyed it. That sounds amazing. That's that's those are great games. The Zelda saga is is just incredible. Um, the next thing that we would like to know is how do you. Is there something that you think that is like the, the, the tipping point or the place where you can where you think the collective journey can can connect with gamification? How do you how do you think that gamification could actually benefit from from the collective journey? Uh, well, I think all gamification um, is um, is something that can benefit from story. Um, uh, without story, to me, uh, 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 gamification is a little bit like uh, uh, offering your dog a biscuit. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you know, you, you, you ultimately you you don't want the dog to to need to the biscuit in order to do the trick. Um, and um, and what gamification does is, is it incentivizes us to do something that we don't necessarily want to do <laughs> um, in, in many respects, not all. Um, uh, so um, when you layer uh, a narrative, compelling story um, uh, over the uh, uh, gamification mechanics, um, you have something that, um, uh, uh, that can last and be memorable and compelling beyond the rule system um, and, and therefore allow for, for uh, uh, the, the person who's engaging in, in this gamified uh, exercise to be able to, to do it without the points or the rewards or, or, or things like that because then you'll have brand loyalty or then you'll have an educated student. Do you see what I'm saying? Absolutely. So, so where where collective journey comes in on top of all of that is um, is the notion that um, uh, uh, you're not necessarily shoving your partner down the hill on that statue. <laughs> <laughs> um, that um, that perhaps um, uh, we can interlock ourselves and um, and and help ourselves collectively. Um, uh, uh, to uh, accomplish uh, the, the very thing that this gamified system wishes us to uh, accomplish. Um, uh, That's fantastic. Uh, and and, yeah. and in, in doing so, we don't necessarily have to discover how we're alike. We can discover how our skills complement one another, um, uh, how, how the combination of our talents, um, our aspirations, our values um, uh, can be uh, assembled to uh, supercharge us, you know, and, and make us all able to, to get through uh, the game um, uh, faster and accomplish more. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And that's a fantastic way of, of linking the whole thing together. There you go. Jeff, is, is there any book that you would, if you had to recommend just one book, which would you recommend to, to the engagers or listeners? Um, well, you know, uh, there's, there's one thing that um, uh, persists even into uh, the collective journey from the old hero's journey. And, um, and that is um, uh, archetypes. Um, uh, these kind of uh, aspirational um, uh, iconic uh, aspects of human character, um, uh, they apply whether you are um, engaged with a, a standard hero's journey narrative, but they also uh, can be really helpful uh, in um, uh, uh, telling a, a collective story because you can combine and mix and match these archetypes to create um, great compelling storytelling effects. Uh, so uh, one of the best books I've read about um, uh, the modern, uh, the contemporary application of archetypes is called uh, The Hero and the Outlaw. Hmm. Never, um, never heard of that one, but we will yeah, certainly yeah. put it in my list. Uh, uh, check it out. The Hero and the Outlaw um, uh, is um, uh, by... Uh, uh, Carol S. Pearson, and um, 
and you could actually uh, you could uh, uh, purchase it uh, off of various book uh, websites. It's it's a slightly older uh, book, um, but it may be even available uh, uh, somewhere um, uh, in PDF uh, the, because it's so educational. Uh, uh, people kind of give it to each other. Um, uh, super super helpful. Fantastic. Um, is there is there somebody that you you think or you would fancy listening to interviewed in in Professor Game? Um, uh, well, um, uh, I um, I'm a supporter of uh, of women in gaming, <laughs> and um, uh, I uh, I have worked with uh, a woman uh, named Jade Raymond. Uh, Jade is um, uh, used to be in charge of. Uh, um, uh, game development at Ubisoft um, in uh, Canada. Uh, she's now uh, freelancing, and she's really, really fascinating. The, the, how she interacts with gaming, her sense of transmedia, her sense of the future of games um, uh, is uh, would be, I think, really uh, interesting to your audience. Yeah, sounds amazing. Well, Jeff, I, our time is almost up, so I would like to know if you have any any final quick piece of advice uh, for those, especially for those of us who have never have never engaged in the in the collective journey. And then, how can we connect with you? And then we'll say, "Well, it's game over." Um, yeah, my my advice is this: um, uh, when when I was first um, uh, trying to uh, uh, examine the hero's journey model and why I was a little uncomfortable with it. You know, even though I loved uh, Star Wars, I loved um, uh, uh, flashy movies and, and TV shows, <laughs> the, there was always the necessity in, in our popular culture for a violent outcome. <laughs> um, conflict, 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 you know. And um, uh, I was a child who was raised um, in a, a, a violent um, uh, neighborhood, um, and and I didn't I didn't like it, <laughs> you know. I, uh, it, it hurt, <laughs> you know. So um, uh, so I thought about uh, whether story can be compelling, uh, but but not glorify. Uh, of violence and and celebrate this kind of masculine, um, uh, you know, um, aggression, and um, uh, and and what I what I found was that there are lots and lots of stories um, that um, that pose alternatives if we um, uh, come to understand that the nature of story has changed because we all have voices now, okay? So what I want your audience to think about is that it's not just um, hero's journey to collective journey. It is broadcast, right, um, to pervasive communication, all right? It's um, everywhere it's, and comes back and forth. Exactly. It's no longer that a very few people are dictating to us what the story is. It's no longer that a few people are shaping our daily reality uh, through all of this um, broadcast communication. Now, we can take um, many, many people, ideas, um, uh, cultures, races, everything into consideration and it's still possible to come up with decisions, um, to come up with with um, uh, developments that are mutually beneficial, that are win-win, um, and um, uh, and that's what uh, a collective journey is all about. It's a new way of telling stories because um, we now have available to us a means by which we can. Not fight on Facebook. <laughs> Their ideas on, on Facebook, and 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 uh, be able to kind of collectively brainstorm uh, solutions. So I'm really hoping that we push through this kind of weird tribal phase on on the internet and evolve ourselves into into something uh, that's truly productive and creative and amazing. Um, you can reach me 
um, uh, you can you can read about my uh, uh, collective journey um, uh, thoughts on uh, blog.collectivejourney.com, right? Okay. And um, and you can follow me on Twitter at Jeff underscore Gomez. Fantastic, fantastic. Thanks very much, Jeff. This is something. This is a topic I could certainly spend all day talking about. But we have to reach an end to the interview, so thanks again, and it's time to say game over. Hey, Engagers. Thank you very much for hanging around. I know this interview was a bit longer, but I'm sure that you know that it was worth it. So thank you very much for listening to Professor Game Podcast. If you want more interviews like this one with Jeff, please let me know. You can also let me know through our email list. You can subscribe at professorgame.com slash subscribe. That way we can get started and I can get your feedback so that you can let me know what do you think of this episode, of the previous episodes, and what are you expecting in the future from Professor Game. And before you go on to your next mission, would you like to know why empathy is so important for gamification design and especially in education? Well, then listen to the next episode of Professor Game. See you there.